Suicide prevention is not a battle we can fight from 20,000 feet up in the sky. It requires brave people to get into the trenches of mental warfare with those who suffer. Few people in the world have done this more often and more courageously than Kevin Briggs. Kevin Briggs is a retired California Highway Patrol officer and one of the world's most active advocates for suicide prevention and awareness. He's a public figure who's known as the guardian of the Golden Gate for his role in intervening to save hundreds of people from ending their lives by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. In today's episode, he actively fights the power of stigma by sharing a deeply personal story, the story of his own childhood trauma, his personal attempt to seek help, his doctor's extremely disappointing response, how he pressed on regardless, and how he later helped his son through a dark and dangerous time. In addition, Kevin talks about his personal experience with stellate ganglion block, a fast emerging treatment option for trauma and chronic stress symptoms. Let's drop into the story. So one of the things that we had talked about was really giving people a sense of maybe the the public persona of Kevin Briggs and what people know about you in terms of your history as a California patrol officer and some of the work you've done around suicide prevention. Right. So I was with the California Highway Patrol from 1990 until 2013. And a lot of my work was done on the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a phenomenal place to go and visit if you haven't been there. But unfortunately, it also is the number one spot in the United States for loss of life to suicide. Uh, And I didn't know this going into this. And I grew up in Marin. Marin connects to San Francisco via this Golden Gate Bridge. But when I started working with the highway patrol, I was wondering why a lot of officers didn't want to work down there. Well, I found out very, very fast why. It's because of the number of suicides and suicide attempts that occur down there and having to speak with these people. It's tough. It's not easy. And I had no training, you know, and that wasn't fair to me, nor the folks who who I was speaking with. So that changed, of course, as I progressed, and I wanted to get more training. And I did, as the years went by, I went through crisis intervention team, CIT, CIT training. And then way towards the later end of my career, I did go through the FBI crisis negotiation course, which was absolutely wonderful. But, um, So the folks understand the the numbers and who we're dealing with. Um, In 2021, there were 25 confirmed suicides off of that bridge and 198 interventions. So that's a lot of people. But the story in that is that there are a lot of people that don't die by suicide because of those interventions. Right. If we get a chance, and it's not just me working down there, uh, it used to be years ago, prior to 9-11, there was one officer working down there, and it was a lot of work. After the tragedy in 9-11, we put more officers down there, and the Golden Gate Bridge folks hired uh, security guards to work down there, and most of them do a, a wonderful job also. So there sure. are other people, and if we can get to these folks, most of the time, if they are over that pedestrian rail, they will come back. So we have a great success rate. So a lot of officers actually avoid being detailed to the Golden Gate Bridge, and you've become known nationally as the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge. Did you begin to seek that out, or how did you come to be referred to as the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge? That actually, as far as I know, it came from a Yahoo News segment, which they aired about six minutes long, and that's what they called me, and then that just kicked in and took off. But to be honest with you, there's many guardians of many Golden Gates. You know, whether you work at a school, you work in a hospital, whatever you do, if you're helping people through, a, you know, a lot of issues that they have and trying to speak with them and trying to find out what is going on, not that we can fix it, but just to be there for people, you know what, you're one of those guardians. Right. So you and others have really kept people in the fight and help them come back from the, the ledge. Um, In so many cases, I I heard a statistic that I just wanted to confirm that you personally, during your time of service, have intervened and been able to save over 200 people from taking their lives. Is that an accurate statistic? Well, I worked the bridge for around 10 years, and I handled four to six cases a month. 
So, you know, I, I hated to discuss numbers when the press would ask me because it sounds egotistical. So I think they came up with that and I used it only because they came up with it. But the actual, if we looked back and in the Highway Patrol, anybody that's familiar with the Highway Patrol knows that we do a lot of writing. So we mm-hmm. keep a lot of statistics on everything we do. I would average four to six cases a month for over 10 years. Wow. And what I want to do is really deviate from the public persona of of who you are known to be and really dive into a little bit of your trauma history. Because one of the things that you and I agree on is that trauma is a human universal. And many times I think with the people that we think of as heroes or people that others look up to, sometimes it's overlooked that they can have their own trauma. And so I want to invite you to share whatever you're willing to share of some of your history of trauma from your childhood. Sure. Very briefly. And of course, you're absolutely right, doctor, in in what you've said there. Um, Briefly, growing up, I'm going to say around age nine for for a a few years, um, I had some abuse by a neighbor. It's still very difficult for me to talk about to, to anybody, but anybody that knows abuse would would figure it out rather easily. Uh, and that bothers me a lot. You and I have, have spoken about this a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that abuse when I was very, very young. And uh, in, let's see, I was 20 years old, 1983, just 20 years old, I was diagnosed with cancer, testicular cancer. Now, mm-hmm. having, I was in the army at the time in Germany, And I underwent uh, one surgery in Germany and then two more back in the States here in San Francisco and then several months of chemotherapy. And uh, I mean, everybody's familiar with cancer nowadays. Back then, you know, they've heard of it, but they didn't know so much about it. We didn't have the computers to look it up and everything else. But I went from 175 down to about 130, 130 pounds, lost all my hair, throwing up all the time. Uh, and that cancer had also spread into my abdomen. So it started spreading around my body. Very, very tough stuff. But uh, did the chemo as I should, and, and it worked fantastic. So here I am. Uh, another one, and I want folks to think about things. How does the mental illness develop in you, mm-hmm. you know, and around you and what happens um, with ourselves? So later on in 1989, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer. And I'm living at the family home at the time. Uh, Chemotherapy did not go well with her for her. So she quit it. And we watched her, we see her go downhill, you know, month after month after month, and then day after day. And she eventually passed right in front of the whole family. We see her last breath. I closed her eyes. And she was only 49 years old at the time, just Mm -hmm. 49. So that's a tough one to have to go through, you know, for anybody watching their their mother, their loved one pass and like that. After you had your battle with cancer, just so yes. I'm tracking. Okay. Yeah. Yes, mine was 1983, 1984, and then hers was 1989. So cancer took her and it ravaged you, but you were able to come through it and get a clean bill of health. Yes. Okay. And then one thing I forgot prior to all of this, actually prior to me being born, my grandfather on my father's side lost his life to suicide. So I was never even able to to know him, to meet him. And to go back to your question or your point, how do you think these experiences have helped you see how people develop mental illnesses? Because, uh, and this is just half of what I have to tell you, but... You see all all these different things that occur in your head and these traumas that just take a toll uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, they just beat you down. And then at night, I would see these images in my head and it's so difficult to try and sleep. And I see that with other people when I chat with them, how it may take them two hours to go to sleep and then they're waking up periodically through the night. So they're not getting the sleep that is so needed. And they go day by day by day with this. And it's just brutal on the body to have Mm -hmm. to live like this. So it just breaks you down over time. And I remember as an adult, you told me that you were having these horrible nights of sleep and these horrible night visions of stuff that happened when you were nine years old. And you went to your doctor and you said, this is bad. You know, you're an adult going to a doctor that you trusted to ask for help. 
Can you share some of that experience? Sure. And on top of all of this, I was involved in a, in a very serious, nasty crash on my motorcycle with the highway patrol where a head injury, um, you know, we, mm-hmm. we talk about head injuries a lot now, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries. Um, I've had three heart surgeries with three stents in my heart. And then also a divorce where my ex-wife, who's doing fine now, wrote a suicide note to each of my boys and was looking up on the computer how to load a gun. Mm. So when I wanted to stop by the house and see the kids, I never knew what I was coming up into. All of these things take a heavy, heavy toll. They certainly do. But getting to that letter. So I come to a point where I want to get better and I want to be at peace. So I decided to write my doctor an email and I described what has been going on with me. He knows my history of all these different things, but I explained it to him once again. And I said, I am not suicidal, but I would like to get some help. I'm I'm tired of living this way. It's just Mm -hmm. not right. I've been living this way for seems decades and it's just doesn't, it's taking a toll on me. Mm -hmm. So he got back to me and he goes, hi, Kevin, thanks for your note. The decision about whether or not to work with a psychiatrist or psychologist in this situation is highly subjective, since it does not sound like you are in any imminent trouble. But if this is something that you would like to explore, you are welcome to call our mental health services, and I hope you find it useful should you do that. Well, you were pretty clear in your email. (laughs) You were very clear about what you what you wanted and what you felt so that's a puzzling letter to receive how did that how did that sit with you to me that was a slap in the face Mm -hmm. it really was and I say you know what um and I'm used to following doctor's advice because I've had to go through doctors all my life based on all these different things yeah I'm thinking they're the ones who've studied it they've been to school I need to follow what they say well this time I said no I've, I've spoken with too many folks like yourself. Yep. And they said, you know what? They could see through me. They see there's hurt inside there. Mm-hmm. And it was very strange for me. How do you know something's going on? I didn't discuss anything with you, but they see it somehow. And just in my verbiage, or even if I'm not, you know, I had never mentioned what happened when I was a child, but they can mm-hmm. still see something's there. So I said, you know what? I'm doing this anyway. And I did. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, a lady, a psychiatrist, very close to my house here, just a few miles away. I went in and was introduced to her, and it was a wonderful experience. It's the first time I ever spoke about this. And she sat down, and she didn't put me in front of her desk. And I think this is very, very important for anybody who's going to have a conversation with someone, Mm -hmm. is don't put a barrier between you. She had her chair cocked sideways and then I was on a chair just on, on an angle from her so I wasn't right in front of her desk and she sat and she listened she had just a couple of questions but she wanted to find out what was up with me how I felt and she wasn't sitting there recording and taking notes she was just listening and it was really really cool and I think that's what folks are are really looking for Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that she put her chair at an angle to you because there is some research that for especially males, it tends to be the most comfortable position for disclosing a trauma if the the chairs are angled. And so if there's no barrier, but you're not directly facing someone and, and, you know, staring right at them, it can be the most comfortable setup for uh, men to talk about their trauma and maybe for other people, women as well, um, based on some of that research. But I want to not miss that point of your doctor that you trusted, who knew all of your trauma history, basically sent you a letter that discouraged you and minimized what you were saying you needed for yourself. And I know there's other people that are going to be listening who have made that um, you know, leap of faith to say, I need help only to be shot down by somebody who doesn't really hear them. I was so disappointed to hear that that happened to you. And I want to know on their behalf, what was that thing in you that said, thank you very much. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to get the help. I was tired of feeling the way that I did because nothing would change if I didn't do anything. Right. 
So it's as if anything else, you know, you have a bad heart, you need to train that heart. And, and if you're a diabetic, you take the medication for such. I was given chemotherapy and operations. Otherwise, I would have died of cancer. Very, you know, simple, very simple. If I didn't do something, um, you know, it could have gone bad. Yeah, yeah. And then you went and you had a really good experience. But that was different than the experience that you had later when your son was in need of help. Yes. And yeah, I'd love to have you share a little bit of, of that experience with us and how that felt. Yes. Well, I have two boys. And when my oldest was 14, he was going through a lot and I didn't see it. And I tell folks, here I am. Watch your kids so close. Be careful. Mm. Uh, here I am flying all over, going out of country, Germany, um, you know, Australia, all sorts of places. And of course, all around the United States, talking about suicide prevention, what to look for, and how to talk to folks. Well, it's happening in front of me at my own home, even though I'm not living with the kids at the time. And I'm missing it. So my boy, I, well, actually, here's the, the quick story of it. I landed coming back from a presentation. I landed at San Francisco Airport. And there's a message on my phone, and it's from my youngest kid. And I thought his name, his, his name is Travis. I thought it would be, hey, Dad, welcome home. Stop by our house on the way to yours. But it wasn't. It was little Travis. He said, Dad, you need to get here quick. Kevin, the 14-year-old, is in the backyard. He smashed an iPad, and he says he's going to kill himself. Hmm. So I worked my way up there. It takes me about an hour. The whole time I'm contemplating, should I call 911 and these different things? Right. But Travis is sending me some texts saying, Dad, you need to get her quick. But when you do, say nice things to Kevin. And I mm -hmm. thought out of all this, that's pretty cute. So mm -hmm. I get there, and there's Travis, my ex, and my sister in the house. And in the backyard is Kevin, and he's in complete darkness, just walking around. So I go out there, and I go, hey, man, what's going on? And this kid just completely breaks down, screaming, crying. Mm -hmm. um, stayed out in that backyard for a long time that night. And I had not seen this. And this is, you know, what I did. And I think this is what parents do a lot is we, we push our kids. So he says, Dad, every time you talk to me or see me, you're talking about grades. Okay, got it. Uh, I had not discussed my divorce with him. And I think a lot of parents do do that because we're embarrassed about it or ashamed. I did not discuss it with him. And he thought he was the cause of it. And that wow. was a really big deal. Really big deal. Yeah. Some kids at school started using marijuana and other drugs, and he wanted nothing to do with it. He knows my stance on it, but he also wants to have friends. That's a critical time when you're an adolescent. So there's that going through his head. And then probably a huge one on top of this was me being divorced, not living at the house. I would go there all the time. Uh, the ex and I had a good relationship. But also me telling him when I'm gone, all right, Kevin, you're the man of the house. If there's a flood, a fire, anything that happens, you got to handle it. And he's just 14. Mm. And I would pound this into his head. You got it. You understand whatever happens, you got to handle it. Oh, this was way too much. He was ready to kill himself. He had had enough. It was way too much. So we decided to see a mental health professional. And on the day of the appointment, I take him and I ask him, Kevin, do you want me in the room with you if I'm allowed? Yeah, dad. Okay. So we get there and a gentleman comes out. And calls us back to his office. I tell him what I do for a living with the highway patrol in case there was some suicide ideation. And we sit down. Uh, Kevin sits right where the gentleman wanted him to, right where he shouldn't be, in my opinion, directly in front of the desk. And then the gentleman sits behind his desk. So now there's this barrier from the start. I'm off on the left. And he starts asking Kevin a series of questions, trying to get to know him. And then he digs into him now and again, too. And he said, well, you know, Kevin, if you were gone, wouldn't your parents be sad? And he said, well, maybe five, six years, and then, they, and then they'd be okay. That's as far as kids are looking into the future. You know, it's mm -hmm. fascinating. And then, well, Kevin, if you were going to kill yourself, how would you do it? Well, I'd use my dad's gun. I go, okay, wow. And then he asked him something that, that caught me off guard and still hurts me today and for our, forever will. He goes, have you ever cut or hurt yourself on purpose? And I know what he's talking about, you know, a cutter, a non-suicidal self-injury. 
I've seen it a lot of times with people down at the bridge, and I'm expecting a no. Um, but he doesn't say anything. He reaches out his left arm like he's holding the knife with his right hand. Cut, he slaps it on his wrist and then cuts it down. So now he's engaging in non-suicidal self-injury because he's in so much pain. Pain, right. And, and I have to look to the right. I'm trying to look away. I'm tearing up. My God, I'm going around teaching this stuff and seeing it, you know, many, many, many times. And it's happening at home in front of me. I feel, you know, a centimeter big. This, this poor little kid is suffering like this. Uh, it was brutal. You know, I, I have heard this before from, you know, people who are leaders in the suicide prevention community have struggled because this is such a common struggle for humans that to have it in their own families is just to be part of the human race, I think, now. And the the shame that can come up for people when they are leaders in the suicide prevention community is kind of this feeling of, of how did I miss this when it's, you know, what I teach. I have heard that as a theme. Um, and so I definitely want to talk more about this and actually capture a few things you said. We're going to take a short break right now. And talk about the work of Give an Hour, who provides uh, free confidential therapy for first responders and veterans. We'll be right back. You can break the barriers of mental health. Give an Hour's mission is to provide help and hope to those in need. As of 2021, Given Hour's volunteer network of mental health providers has delivered over 360,000 hours of barrier-free, no-cost mental health care. With a small gift of $5, you can give help and hope. Your generosity will allow Given Hour to deliver confidential mental health services and vital education tools. Thank you for your support, because mental health is just as important as our physical health. Visit www.givenhour.org to learn more or to donate. So, Kevin, we were talking about going uh, into the office, the therapist's office, with your son when he was in a time of crisis. Um, and I want to not miss something that you talked about in terms of the end of your relationship with his mother, the divorce. Um, and kids often will tend to feel that they are the cause. It's just the way the water runs for kids based on how their developmental stage um, comes along that they think they are the reason for all the things that happen. Um, because at that stage in their lives, everything seems to be sort of focused on them or caused by them in their own minds. I want to have you talk more about that because I know that that's a common thing that you can speak some wisdom into. Right. As, as far as with Kevin, I thought we had a good relationship, even though I wasn't there all the time. Um, I would go down to that house almost every day when I was here. And, and now I get to work at schools in, in my area here. I go to 13 different schools a couple of days a week when I'm not traveling. And I get a chance to talk to kids and, and see what is going on and watch them. They'll break down because um, they're looking for somebody else to talk to. Sometimes it's just not their parents. So when I get a chance to speak with parents, I say whether that's a coach, a mentor, a teacher, you know, we need to all, we're going to see different things and try to put all these together for the betterment of that child. But um, with Kevin, it, it got even worse, to be honest with you, at that appointment okay. with, with that individual, because he asked him a few more questions. And then he took a second. And then he asked him a question like this. He goes, well, Kevin, because you're not suicidal, right? Oh. And, and it shocked me. He didn't validate Kevin. He didn't do any of the things that I thought you should do, normalize how he's feeling and everything else. So, of course, he said no. But then he looked over at me because I had spoken with him before we went in the office. And he asked me, did you cover all the, did I cover all the bases? I'm like, boy, I don't know. I was at a loss. We came to this gentleman for help. Um, that was a tough one. What did you do? Did you ask for a different doctor or how did no. you respond? I asked if I could speak with them afterwards for a few minutes. And you know, I, I highly value their opinions and, and doctors and what they have to say. 
but I also wanted him to know that what he did wasn't quite right. So I tried to word it and I don't remember my exact wording, but it was, well, this is what I've been taught. And this is kind of the standard in the community of negotiations and things. And I think he was embarrassed. So I don't know. And I want folks to know this. Not every mental health professional is trained in suicide assessment. It's a fact. It is getting getting better and better, but. You are so kind. You are so kind. Uh, Uh, Hearing that story makes me cringe. And it also reminds me that mental health professionals are often anxious about this conversation. Um, I've trained a lot of psychologists. And as they've come up through the training, sometimes, honestly, there's a fear that people will say, yes, I am suicidal. And if they don't feel like they know how to hold that or respond to it or help people navigate that pain with confidence, they can contribute to avoidance of that conversation in just the way that you describe by sort of forcing people down a chute of, well, you're not really suicidal, are you? Where the person would be unlikely to say, well, actually, I I am or I have been. Um, how did you respond in that moment with your son, given that you knew what had happened a few days before and how desperately suicidal he had been? So I had a long talk with him afterwards, and mm-hmm. I kind of did it like I would with someone over the rail, you mm-hmm. know, but I already had the rapport. And that's a huge one is if you already have rapport, you can skip a lot of different things. Yes. So I wanted us... And I wanted him to be able to talk without judgment, without thinking that I'm going to judge him or thinking that I can fix it. Because as guys, typically we want to fix everything. You know, why are you thinking that way? You should be thinking this way. Mm -hmm. And you have everything made. You you don't, you know, I'm paying for everything. You, you get to live off of me. And why would you be thinking like that? But I had this conversation with him and a lot of things came out. Mm-hmm. And he said, I, I was suicidal because I'm feeling better right now because I don't want to go back to that place. So I let him talk for quite a while. And then I let him know that I don't care what happens. And parents say this, but I don't care what happens in your life. You're the most important. You can talk to me at any time of the day. Even if I'm not around, you can call me. And I want them to know there's no judgment. I just want you to be safe. So, so he was in excruciating pain. He was suicidal when you talked to him in that the darkness of the backyard, but he was in less pain and had broken through some of that pain in the follow-up conversation that you attended with the doctor. Yes. And that was simply by being there. I, to tell you the truth, I don't know if that doctor did any good that day because he, he may have done some harm, actually. Yeah, maybe. But, That's what I'm tending to think. Yeah. But by me, but you being did there something. Telling them, you know, you, you did something. You did something in that conversation where your son was able to break down and say the expectations you have of me to be the man of the house to get grades. Um, how did you respond to that pain in that moment? I told him these are things that I want, not that you may want. I'm putting way too much on you, and I apologize for that. Um, we talked about this for quite a while. You know, you just be a little kid. If things happen, they're going to happen. But, you know, to feel the way you are, God, that's got to be very, very tough from where you're standing. I want to let you know that I'm here for you, that I love you, that you can talk to me at any time, you know, and we'll try and work through this. The greatest thing I have are you two kids. So. I'm still learning. Adults, we're always learning. You know, sound like things that I did were quite right. And I tell people about these in my talks, but I'm doing it with you. And I shouldn't have done that with you. I need to, instead of being this kind of type A cop, is to really be the loving father. Well, we're all learning, including myself. I certainly make plenty of mistakes as a mom and a wife all the time. Um, And so, you know, it's uh, if you're in a long marriage, you learn that you're just not so hot yourself, you know, after a while, I think is part of the lesson. But um, 
I think with our kids, it's interesting because you had a unique ability to free him up from this connection he was making in his head with my dad's love is conditional based on how I am the man of the household or what grades I get. You were able in that conversation to defuse those two things and let him know that you love him regardless and that that is not something that you would want to rule his life. Yes, absolutely correct. You also in that conversation, did you get to the pain around, you know, was he at fault for the divorce or, you know, responsible for the breakup of the marriage? Did that get addressed in that conversation in some form as well? It did. That's one of the first things I spoke about. And I talked about why I didn't, because I wanted him to understand it. This is why I didn't talk to you about it. You know, I, I didn't want you to be affected by this, but of course they're going to be affected. I'm not there. The father isn't there. So I'm pretty much just thinking of myself this whole time and kind of ducking out of my responsibilities is what I did. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that one, Kevin, <laughs> because, because I know your heart and I know you're a protector. I know you're a defender. So many times in my experience, protectors and defenders withhold information out of a protective instinct and they mean well, but it doesn't work out well. And those are two different things. You know, it's often people will say, well, I don't want to tell you about what I'm experiencing because I don't want you to have those thoughts, feelings, images in your head, um, or I'm, I'm trying to protect you from these negative experiences. But the reality is that we can often adjust to a known um, challenge. What we really don't do well with is knowing that a situation has gone sideways or that relationships have devolved and uh, we don't really understand our place, our role, our, um, you know, not that he contributed to that, but just having an understanding of the factors that led to a dissolution of a relationship or a change in one's life is key for moving through that kind of trauma. And so anxiety exists in proportion to what we don't know. But I wouldn't say that you did that because you were self-interested because that's not who I experienced you to be at all. I, I think you probably did it because you were trying to protect him. And that's what I often see with warriors, protectors, but it just doesn't translate well. And I think you nailed it on the head there in just a few, in just a few words. Yes. I would Could have totally said in a few less words. <laughs> Never use 10 words when a million will do. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, what would you want? Because marital dissolution, 50% of new marriages end in divorce. 63% of remarriages end in divorce. This is an issue we have to get ahead of with kids. What would you recommend for other parents who are going through a separation or divorce in terms of looking out for their kids based on what you've learned? I would say, I would hope there's a good book out there for you. But I would also say if not, or in, in, even instead of that, seek counseling of how to talk to kids about it. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know, and I kind of put it on the back end. Now they're boys, they're, they're tough, they'll suck it up, they'll be fine. But they're not. They're not. So find somebody who knows about this. And I know whatever kind of counseling that, you know, whatever thing is going on in your life, it's a divorce, make sure you get a, a, someone that knows about divorce. If it was trauma from a childhood, make sure you get somebody that specializes in that. So you, like what you've told me, talking to the kids and about, get somebody who knows about it. I think um, if I had to do it again, that's what I would do. Here's how common your experience is, though. I'm going to actually go a little bit more forceful on that one and say, kids think it's about them. They think they caused it or contributed to it in some way as a general rule. So um, if people are going through a divorce or a separation, flush that out and reckon with it directly with your kids. Get that information out to them that they are not the cause of a separation or a divorce. They are not a contributor to that. Um, as part of that conversation you have with them. Now, I did want to also talk to you about the stellate ganglion block. You know, we were just in the clinic together about a week ago now. And um, 
I saw that you were still having some of those symptoms um, and you went in and, and had a stellar ganglion block. And I, I'd love to give you an opportunity to share what that experience was and, and how it's going for you. Yes, uh, the procedure actually went very well. Uh, wonderful staff down there in, in San Jose. They brought me in, explained everything. And of course, you were there to walk me through everything also. So it, it was fantastic. And all you think about, and I don't want to turn people off by this, but you think about there's a needle or two going into your neck, maybe uh -huh. over by your spine. But let that go. It's way different. Um, and I didn't even get the anesthesia they were going to provide. I just had a very a local anesthesia. And I went great. I was talking to them. As you saw and you attested yeah. to this, my blood pressure actually went down during the procedure. Yep. We might even have that on video. So I have the <laughs> video to prove it. It was <laughs> fascinating. I mean, you were such a, it's clear to me that you had done the work of, you know, going through therapy and learning skills to use to regulate your body because you got in there and you had good rapport with the doctor that was providing this injection. Um, for those unfamiliar, stellate ganglion block is an injection of an anesthetic medication that goes into the front area of the neck, a few inches above the collarbone. And Stella makes two injections um, about the size of a mosquito bite. And Kevin was there for about 15 minutes. I was in the operating room with him. And you were breathing and you were, you know, going into a kind of meditative state. And I watched your blood pressure come down in real time, which was really cool. Now, it was a neat procedure. Uh, no after effects. It, it went, everything went very smooth. Now, I have a, a very, very difficult time falling asleep and staying asleep. Um, a difficult time concentrating, all sorts of issues. I take a lot of medications for blood pressure, for cholesterol, uh, to keep my heart from beating too fast, all, all sorts of different medications. But anyway, Here's what I've seen to date. I still have a little difficulty falling asleep, but once I am asleep, my sleep is better than it was before. I don't seem to be or get as irritated so easily as I did before. And my concentration level seems to be better. I can sit longer and really dive into these different deals that I'm, that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. You know, I know that after the procedure, you had a cup of coffee, you know, granted, but you were focused and you worked, you know, just worked really hard and were sustaining this focus for hours and hours. Um, and so people have different reactions. Some people after the procedure, they take a very long nap or they go to sleep for 10 or 12 hours to try and catch up on all the sleep they've missed for years. Um, other people do feel like running a marathon. <laughs> you know, really digging in. And so I wish I could say everybody's going to respond one way or the other, but it's in the longer run. I'm so excited to hear about some of those positive effects and we'll be keen to follow you from here and see what your progress is. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. It was, uh, it was very easy. And anybody that knows me knows I've had quite a number of surgeries for all sorts of different things. Um, this was this was very easy. And it always, you know, you're apprehensive going into it. Okay, what happens and, and what could happen? But during the process, they kept walking me through it and telling me, here's what I'm going to do. The doctor was fantastic. Here's what I'm going to do. Okay, you should be feeling this. This is what's going on. And and next thing, you know, we're almost joking as she's doing this. I mean, she, but she mm -hmm. was very professional. Um, but also the empathy and the human side was there also. I sound yeah. like a salesman, but it, but it really was cool. It, it was it was fantastic. Well, you know, you guys did have a really nice rapport, um, but I'm grateful to you for sharing. And, you know, I was nervous too when I got a stellar ganglion block. I was, you know, had that anticipatory anxiety like a lot of people um, and some of the bravest warriors that I've I've referred and stood over in treatment rooms, I've had that same anticipatory anxiety. I also got it uh, without sedation and it was no big deal. So I think a lot of what, what we can do is demystify the procedure a little bit so that those who suffer have good information about what to expect. So I'm grateful to you for, for sharing that experience as well today. 
Is there anything else, Kevin, I want to give you kind of a last word on something about trauma or what people need when they're really in the tunnel of despair, what they really need from you who has really made it your life's mission to pull people back from the ledge and bring them back to hope to include your son? Sure. I'm going to say, I don't care how bad it gets. It's going to pass just like the day. And it doesn't make it any better. I have days where I still don't want to go out. You know, I've suffered from depression and a number of things. But here's the kicker is I know it's going to pass. So live it, you know, go through this, find some, some different techniques. If you need something, you know, a crisis safety plan for those who may be suicidal. I really believe in those. Um, and doctor, I, I think you may even have some. I have one that we could let folks see or, or use. I'm mm -hmm. a big believer in those planning for this, especially, you know, if you know an anniversary is coming up when you lost a child or a loved one, you know, those are tough days, something like that. Um, and then have a good support group, especially males. We don't tend to do this. After I retired in 2013, I started going out to coffee three to four days a week with a group of folks who we are all completely different in our professions, uh, big age gaps, but we have a great time just talking about everything. So to get you out of that house and to get somebody to talk to, uh, it, it simply, it's been wonderful for me. So don't be afraid to get out and know you're going to have those bad days, but they will pass. Yes. So find your tribe. Um, anticipate that there will be times around anniversaries of trauma or loss when you might need a little bit of structure, even your own voice from a more calm time in your life saying, here are your resources, you know, here are the things that you can do to pull yourself out of that tunnel. Here are the people that you can connect with to remind you of your value and your tribe. Um, all of those things are critical. And what we can do is if you have one you want to share in particular, we can put that uh, crisis response plan on the show notes page for this episode so that folks can access it there. Um, so what a wonderful depth of knowledge and wisdom you were able to share based on not only your sort of professional experience as a highway patrol officer who saved many lives, however many that number is, um, every life counts but also somebody who's gone through it in a personal sense, both your own time of struggle just with mental health um, and your son's time of struggle and really um, gained a lot of insight and wisdom from it. So thank you so much, Kevin, for your courage and for, for sharing that wisdom with all of us today. Doctor, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for doing this. because I think it'll help a lot of people just listening to you, you know, and the folks that you have on. And that's what this is about, making that, that is, That's it. When we connect, we survive. Kevin is seen by many people as a hero within the suicide prevention community. Yet he resists this characterization and shows us that even our heroes struggle at times. Suicide has impacted Kevin not just in his career, but in very personal ways. One of his grandfathers died by suicide. His ex-wife struggled with the time of acute suicidality. And his teenage son went through a dangerous period as well. One of the truths to emerge from Kevin's story is this. Even the most seasoned suicide prevention experts do not have psychological x-ray vision. While knowing the signs can help prevent suicide, in many cases, discerning risk comes down to creating a habit of emotional openness in our closest relationships. Because Kevin created this trust with both of his sons, he was able to support his older son during a challenging time. When we become aware that someone is in a dark place, there are high stakes in how we respond. This is where Kevin really shines. He understands that being fully human and compassionate is how we can destroy the lie that a death by suicide is the only way to end suffering. Kevin also had the recent benefit of personally experiencing Steli ganglion block, a promising new treatment for both recent and remote trauma impacts. SGB has been life-saving for many of the warriors and first responders in my personal network. Although Kevin was not suicidal when he had this treatment, 
he was able to see how it can quickly reduce trauma symptoms. For those who suffer from self-destructive thoughts, SGB is a powerful way to show them that they're not broken and there's hope and effective help. Post-traumatic stress is not a life sentence. Trauma can be healed with the right insights, the right treatments, and the right support. The story of our trauma is presented by Stella. Visit www.stellacenter.com to learn more about Stella's breakthrough trauma treatments. Please share this episode with people you care about who have been impacted by trauma. And remember to subscribe on Spotify and other streaming platforms.